Okay. Ok, allora buonasera a tutti, benvenuti. Io sono Ilaria Menolasci, una curatrice di OGR Public Program, il programma di formazione promosso dalla Fondazione Arte Moderna e Contemporanea CRT in collaborazione con le OGR. Um, L'incontro di questa sera fa parte del progetto OGR U, curato dalla dottoressa Barbara Casavecchia, qui presente. E, um, oggi pomeriggio eh, i, ragazzi hanno avuto, i ragazzi del progetto di OGR U hanno effettuato un, un workshop molto particolare con l'ospite di questa sera. E, tra l'altro sarebbe anche bello magari se raccontate qualcosina anche del workshop di oggi, no? Dopo? Alla fine? Va bene. Um, L'ospite di questa sera, Payam Sharifi, che io ringrazio per essere qui, eh, fa parte del collettivo Slavs and Tatars, un collettivo di fama internazionale che ha base a Berlino ma che lavora in tutti i continenti e, e magari lascio, lascio a Barbara qualche, qualche parola in più su, sul loro lavoro. Intanto grazie ancora e grazie a tutti voi per essere qui. Buona serata. Grazie, grazie a Payam per essere venuto, e per aver lavorato con noi e per questa lecture performance che si terrà questa sera. Aggiungevo solo poche cose a quello che ha detto Ilaria. Eh, L'area sulla quale lavora Slavs and Tatars, che è comunque un collettivo, non è solo Payam qui con noi stasera, impegnato su un'area a est dell'ex muro di Berlino e a ovest della grande muraglia cinese, altresì nota come Eurasia. Molto si parlerà anche di linguaggi, traduzioni, come dire, barriere geografiche, culturali e via di seguito. Uh, Slavs and Tatars uh, sono stati protagonisti di mostre importanti dal MoMA di New York a Salt di Istanbul, alla Secession di Vienna, alla Constalle di Zurigo, all'Ujadowski Center for Contemporary Art di Varsavia. Hanno in preparazione una grande mostra a Dresda che aprirà presto e la scorsa settimana hanno aperto ad Arge Kunst di Bolzano una mostra dal titolo Kirch Genga Benga, is that correct? Mm. <ride> che è in corso fino al 28 di luglio, mentre il 19 di luglio saranno alla centrale di FIES per il programma di performances, live works, e li cito anche perché tutti insieme abbiamo cercato di organizzare il loro tour, la loro presenza in Italia in questi giorni. Uh, senza aggiungere molto altro, passo la parola a Payam e buona lecture e ci sarà spazio per delle domande a seguire. Grazie Barbara, Ilaria e uh, Sergei e uh, the rest of the OGR team for, uh, for organizing this evening. Tonight's lecture performance is called The Transliterative Teas, and we're going to be looking at the, the, f the phenomenon of transliteration, which is changing alphabets within the same language, as a way of looking at language not through the cerebral analytical cortex, but through a more affective, metaphysical, sensual approach to language. I give a, maybe a, a short biography because this is our, only our second lecture performance in Italy in, the, in a span of four or five days. Um, we started out as a reading group, a kind of informal reading group, something in between Oprah Winfrey and um, maybe Attila the Hun, sort of changing material back and forth that was no longer available in English, translating into English material which had never been translated. These are, are in the past... 12 years, we've published almost 10 books. It's important uh, for me to insist that these are not catalogs, these are not monographs, these are not books on us. We do not let anybody write books about us. Um, normally in an exhibition, what happens is a museum invites you, they give you a budget, they say here's 15-20% of your budget, 10% of your budget, please publish a book. You invite, they ask you, who do you want to invite? I invite Barbara to write about us because she is a respected curator. She makes us look good. We are emerging artists, we make her look good. This is the, the kind of equivalent in the art world of insider trading. 
you know, in the stock market. This would be illegal in any other industry, but in the art world, it's kind of standard protocol. So our books are actually um, platforms of research. One of the books we'll talk about tonight, uh, two of them tonight, but this one is about the relationship between Iran and Poland from the, ninth, from the 17th century to the 21st century. This one is about mirrors for princes, a kind of genre of advice literature, like Machiavelli's Prince, but in Muslim world, the kind of the first political science. So we research the books, we write them, or we commission other people to write. Um, and we, it's, the reason we do this is because we also want to make sure there's a healthy distance between criticism and art itself. So if I invite a, a, a curator or a critic to write about us, this critic, this critic will not be objective because I'm inviting them. So it's like somebody coming to your house and complaining about the dinner you cook. It's not going to happen. So it's very it, it has proved to be quite productive because there's been a, a healthy amount of criticism about us, I would say. Uh, we have a lot of press, but we also have a lot of difficult press. I don't know many other artists who have six-page negative reviews. It doesn't happen anymore, but uh, we've had that also, which I think is a very healthy part of the ecosystem. So today, um, in, the, in the workshop, we talked a little bit about the figure and this idea of looking at history and resuscitating history. Resuscitation is the idea of... I use this word resuscitation because resuscitation is something you do when there's a moment of urgency, emergency, right? When his, it's the idea of putting your lips onto the lips of history and breathing into history, life again. Now, what's interesting about resuscitation is it's different from kissing, right? The person you're resuscitating didn't ask for you to put their lips on their lips. There's nothing romantic, there's nothing sensual. It's a question of, of necessity. And there's something disrespectful about resuscitation. Nobody invited you, but you're doing it anyway. And this is very important because as an artist, when you deal with research, a lot of artists today are ca call themselves or call ourselves research-based practice. It's very important at some point to break the research. What that means is to, you have to disrespect your sources at some point. And to disrespect your source, you have to respect it. But to respect it, you have to disrespect it. Because that's the only way you're bringing something to the conversation, is to break it in some sense. And this idea of disrespecting your source, or resuscitation, is a kind of... The mascot is a figure that we use quite often. This is a figure, a folkloric figure of the 12th century. A figure you find everywhere. There used to be Muslims living in Europe, all the way to Asia, Croatia, all the way to China down to Somalia. This is a figure whose name is Mullah Nasreddin. In Arabic, they call him Nasreddin Joha. In Farsi, we call him Mullah. In Turkish, they call him Hoja Nasreddin. Chinese call him Afanti Nasreddin. But he's a kind of trickster, um, 12th century fool, kind of buff buffon, buffon, but wise kind of buffon. Um, and he's the closest thing in, let's say, Muslim culture to La Fontaine's fables or the Brothers Grimm in uh, this idea of telling children stories th of Nasruddin through which you, you can explain more complex subject matter. For example, my favorite, actually another favorite Nasruddin story that I didn't tell today is there's one person on one side of the river and he yells to Nasruddin, Mola Nasruddin, how do I get to the other side of the river? And Nasruddin answers, you are on the other side of the river. So this very first-degree humor, very simple, very stupid humor, but behind it is questions of, again, morality, perspective, um, and, and others. And I, spoke, I mentioned the other one today. Nasruddin is always riding, or often riding backwards on his donkey. So the donkey is going this way, but he's looking backwards. And this figure, this kind of position, is a position that we call an anti-modernist position. Now, what I mean by anti-modernist doesn't... It's not to be against modernity, because we are not against what modernity has brought us, but it's a question of, of, of putting pressure on the ideas of modernity. Modernity, essentially, if we believe what Marx, Weber, Durkheim, Freud have said, is that there's a new modern man, woman, 
and he or she is different than pre-modern man or woman. We don't believe this is true. We don't believe humans are different today than they were two, three hundred years ago. But also, it's a term we borrow from a French professor whose name is Antoine Compagnon, who teaches at the Collège de France in Paris and at Columbia University. And he defines the anti-modern in a book on French literature, but we take it outside of French literature. And he says, the true modernists are not the Marinettis, the Mayakovskis, who believe that the future accelerationism, digitalization, industry will bring us all of our, our, uh, our deliverance from weakness that will deliver us into kind of health, into success. The true modernists, says Compagnon, are those people who are going into the future, but a little bit conflicted about the passing of the pre-modern age, who are not convinced that pre-modernity was so bad or was all wrong. So he uses the example of Sartre, who describes Baudelaire as driving into the future, but with an eye on the rearview mirror, always looking over his shoulder in the rearview mirror of the car. Of course, some of you will know also another example of this is Walter Benjamin's Angel of History, who's being propelled towards the future, but facing the kind of rubble or the, the destruction of the past and present. Now, unfortunately, the languages that I speak are all Indo-European, and in those languages, we see to what extent we are, our perspective, spatial perspective on time is positivist. Meaning, in Russian, in French, in English, when you describe the future, you describe it in, in front of you, and we describe the past as behind us, which, in, which means that somehow our language is saying that the past is irrelevant because it's behind us, and that we know where we're going because the future is ahead of us. Now, if anything, the past 10 years has shown us, it's shown that this is not the case, right? Nobody thought that the Middle East would be even worse now than it was 10 years ago. Nobody thought that the current person in the, in the White House would be that, the person that it is. Nobody thought that the EU would be in the situation it is. Nobody thought the Eastern European nations would start to strangely um, imitate Russian illiberalism, the kind of very nation that they are trying to define themselves against. But in, Mal in Madagascar, the, the language of Malgash from Madagascar, they have a different way of describing the future and the past. They describe the past as in front of you, and the future is behind you. So it's a much more accurate way of, of, th of, of, of describing time and history and progress. Now, this is a figure of Mola Nasruddin that we, we did for the Guangzhou Biennial. I think, I, I don't remember the year, 2012. But... Uh, this is the figure of Nasruddin himself, and when children ride Nasruddin, the first question they ask, as I mentioned today, is they ask their parents, why am I holding an old man from his belly? Why am I not holding an old, uh, the person from behind? And so this very simple sculpture has to articulate the same complexity that Nasruddin's stories do, because the parents have to tell their children story, sort of que questions of progress, morality, time, through a very simple means so that the child can understand. Now, this is a, this is a, a kind of methodology that we call the, the splits. Spagata, is it called? Which I'm wearing jeans, and just jeans are really the worst thing for doing the splits. I can almost do it, but not in jeans, and not today. Um, but we're interested not in the splits of the legs, but the splits of the mind, so metaphysical splits. And what I mean by splits of the mind is how can we bring two ideas, two, two registers, two voices that are generally in conflict or contradictory or mutually exclusive or are paradoxical into one space, one voice, one register, one idea. Oops. In English, there's lots of terms for this. Of course, most of them are not English. As you can see, they're Latin, so this should be familiar for some of you. But we call this amphiboly. We call it cognitive dissonance. For those of you who are Catholics or Christian, you should understand, you should know the coincidenti oppositorum is this idea that to describe God or the transcendent, you have to use the language of unreason, irrational language, because 
the God, because God or the transcendent cannot be described by our language because our language is too limited. So it must be a, a kind of a, a paradoxical language. Now, this is a very early example of this kind of uh, coincidenti oppositorum. This says in English, dig the booty of monoglots, but marry my child a polyglot, which means if you're going to have a one-night stand and just sleep around, better do it with somebody who speaks one language, but if you're serious and want to settle down, better do it with somebody who speaks many languages. Now, for those of you who are familiar or not with English, normally people in English who start the sentence with dig the booty don't end with monoglot or polyglot because dig the booty is a kind of slang from the street and polyglot and monoglot is much more official language. And here, it's not translated, but it's transliterated. So in the middle, it says dig the booty of monoglots. And in the same in the Arabic and Persian above. It has dig the booty of monoglots, bat, mari, because there's no uh in Russian, so you have to say bat, mari, my child, a polyglot. Now, transliteration is basically like the trashy, not chic, younger sibling, brother or sister to translation. Translation is very noble. Nabokov did it, Edgar Allan Poe did it. It's a very imp there's departments of universities that are devoted to translation. But transliteration, nobody thinks about the switching of alphabets within the same language because it's considered to be kind of transactional. If you go to another country, they do it for the tourists. Or if you're an Arabic speaker, you write in Latin to your parents often because you don't want to learn the Arabic script. Or I write in Farsi, in Persian, Finglish. I write Persian with Latin letters on the computer to my parents. I don't make the effort to, to rewrite in, in the Persian alphabet. Now, another example of this kind of metaphysical splits, or this spagata, is two figures normally you don't bring in the same page are Marx and Muhammad, right? Marx, for me, is a kind of, for the leftists, and I know that Italy has a strong tradition of leftism, Marx is kind of like an abusive husband. We keep going back to Marx over and over again, and we think that this time he will be nice to me, this time he, won't, he will love me, he won't beat me up, but he keeps beating us up in some sense. And Muhammad is kind of the, the shushu of the right, some people think, you know, like kind of right-wing traditionalist, but actually neither Marx is as left as people think, and Muhammad is not as right as people think. Now, the reason why we're interested in Marx and Muhammad in the same screen is not because I want Molotov cocktails to be thrown through the OGR and have trouble with security, is because we, as Barbara mentioned, our biography is between the former Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China. And the two, normally you don't put these two walls in the same sentence, first of all. They don't have much to do with each other. They're anachronistic walls. One is in the mid-20th century, and the other one is in the, one is the Chinese wall? I'm, I'm blanking. Sixth century? Seventh century? Anyway. But also the, 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 the geopolitical narratives that accompany these walls are the narratives of communism and political Islam. Because political Islam in this century is what communism was in the 20th century. It's the challenge, let's say, if you believe the news, it's the challenge of liberal Western democracy. In the 20th century, it was communism. Today, it's political Islam. And we're not the first people or the only people to say this. Many other people say this as well. Olivier Roy, who is a specialist of, of Islam in, 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 um, in France, he's become famous recently because of the attacks in Paris, unfortunately. But he was saying many years ago that the reason why you have radicalization in, outside of Paris, in the banlieue, is because you don't have Trotskyism anymore. You don't have leftist groups that can accommodate this frustration, class frustration, integration. But 30, 40 years ago, they would be Trotskyists or they would be Marxists. Today, they're radicalized by, by Islam. So it's not the question of the radicalization of Islam, but more the Islamization of radicalism that, it, that we're dealing with today. Now, another person who talks about this is a very interesting gentleman on the left named Norman Brown. Norman Brown is a specialist of William Blake, and 
he became, he was a professor of comparative literature in University of California, Santa Cruz. He, in very famous in the 60s, 70s, he became a kind of cult figure of the flower power generation. He wrote a book where he psychoanalyzed the whole of history. And this book became a crossover success. The New Yorker wrote about it. And Norman Brown continued until the late 80s. And in the late 80s, he decides to devote his whole rest of his life, 10, 15 years, to reading the Quran, the Book of the Islam. Not because he becomes a Muslim. No, he stays a Methodist his whole life. But he says that the Quran is the first modernist text and that until James Joyce existed in the West, we could not understand the Quran as a text because we did not have the tools, the literary tools to understand this text. Why? If you look, if you compare the Quran with the Old Testament or New Testament, the Bible or the Jewish Bible, time is not linear, but it's cyclical. And characters morph into other characters. So you turn the page, Joseph becomes Jesus, turn the page, Jesus becomes Hagar, the next page, Hagar becomes Muhammad, Muhammad turns back into Moses. So it's a little bit like this, uh, do you remember the scene from David Lynch's Lost Highway? And you pull out, and Bill Pullman, it, all of a sudden, is Baltazar Getty on the grass. There's no explanation, but the character becomes another character. And Norman Brown, actually himself, says that in the, hundred and, in the, first, in the Finnegan's Wake of James Joyce, you can find the 110 of the 114 chapter headings of the Quran, the Surat, in Finnegan's Wake. Now, of course, you can say, if you try hard enough, you can find anything in Finnegan's Wake, right? It doesn't matter, the Quran, the Talmud, the Torah. But Norman Brown also goes on to say that Marxism and Islam, he calls them two old revolutionary forces, two tired old horses. But that we should not take any pleasure from their failure because both Marxism and Islam, they agree on one point, which is there shall be one world or there shall be none. Now, this has a double meaning, of course. One world means one world connected, but it can also mean one world as in no, a conformist world, a, a, mono, a, a homogenous world with no dissent, let's say. The first time we became interested in language politics, or the first book on language politics we made, is a book on the right called <sighs> Now, H is a sound which is unlike other sounds in language. Instead of pronouncing it by pushing air through your throat, you're stopping the passage of air. So you're creating a blockage to pronounce it. Even more conceptual for, let's say, some languages, is the H of Quran, it's a glottal stop. So you're saying L, which doesn't exist in Russian, but H, at least, if you look at the three letters in the middle of the tongue, the left is the Hebrew, the middle is Cyrillic, and on the right is Arabic. These three letters, H, H, and H, here, H in Arabic, H in Cyrillic, H in, Arab, in, uh, Cyrillic, in Arab, Hebrew, they're considered to be a sacred sort of phoneme in many of these languages. For example, in Hebrew, chet is the letter of life, the, the word itself of life, and it has a very special numerological value. In Kabbalah, in Islam, the value of ch is 100, which also has a very important significance. But also, I, I kind of sometimes say that ch is an anti-imperialist phoneme because Americans and English cannot pronounce it. So it's a kind of challenge to, let's say, an imperialist world order. Because if you just try to ask an English speaker to say, huh, they have a very difficult time with this sound. Now, the first person, one of the people who talked about huh as a kind of Slavic uh, important phoneme was Chlebnikov, who was a Russian futurist, who was kind of an enemy of Marinetti in some sense. Chlebnikov really didn't like Marinetti's accelerationism and futurism. And in fact, Chlebnikov disliked Marinetti so much that he didn't like using the Latin word futurismus or futurismo. He, li he used the Russian word, which was bududliani, using the Russian Slavic or, uh, root of future. But Chlebnikov also identified 40 words in Slavic languages that start with H that mean shelter or habitation or house. Now, when you're, when you're studying the kind of origins of languages, it's very important. The things you first look to are sky, 
ground, sun, shelter. And he found 40 of these words. And this ch is a kind of fricative, right? It's, a, it's the, 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 f- the friction that you create by stopping the passage of air. Now, Chlebnikov also, unlike Saussure, believed that there was a reason why certain letters follow other letters. He, he called this an inner declension of a word. So he said, for example, if you take the word for trash or rubbish in Russian, chlam, and you change the L, the second letter, after the X, into R, chram, you sublimate it. So the, the R is sublimating or elevating what is low to high. Another example of this, of course, what, another important thing Klebnikov did was he, he um, was important in innovate in doing rhymes within the line and not at the end of the line of the poetry. And I'll, I'll read the Russian for you here. It's a very good English translation, but the Russian here reads, maybe Sergei, you should read it, huh? Nash kochin, ochin azabochin, nož a tochin, tochin ochin. And in English, it's a good translation, actually. It doesn't mean anything what the Russian says, but it says, let us not let knives, let us not be heads of lettuce, let us not let knives upset us. And this kind of rhyming within the line is something that in hip-hop music was very important because Notorious B.I.G., whom you're familiar with, was one of the first people in hip-hop to, to do this. And an example is, uh, is here. We can play it maybe a bit louder than uh, usual. We used to fuss when the landlord dissed us. No heat. Wonder why Christmas missed us. Birthdays was the worst days. Now we sip champagne when we thirsty. Uh. Try it one more time. We used to fuss when the landlord dissed us, no heat, wonder why Christmas missed us. Birthdays was the worst days, now we sip champagne when we thirsty. Uh. So Chlebnikov's philosophy was a philosophy called Za'um. Za means beyond, trans, and um is sort of rationalism, the mind, spirit in some sense. And when we found this term in English, we thought, it's not such a nice translation, transrational. It sounds like very technical. And we're really not, I mean, as, as you can see, we're a little bit obsessed with language, but we're really not interested in linguistics. Because, in fact, ling- for me, if you want to, for me, the easiest way to fall asleep is if you give me a book about linguistics, I'll be asleep in five minutes. But I'm really interested in philology. And philology, of course, is the study of language through literature, through religion, through history, through texts of culture of some sort. And it's interesting why, in fact, it's another discussion, of course, but even the word philology we don't use anymore in the West, in France and England and America, because it has connotations of uh, German instrumentalization, of sort of Nazism, National Socialism. Today, all the departments of language in the United States are called linguistics departments, not philology departments. But we found another translation for Za'um, which is beyond sense. And that was the name we decided to give to our first exhibition at the MoMA, our only exhibition at the MoMA, I should say. Um, za- beyond sense is, is a nice word because inside of beyond sense, you have nonsense, but also inside of beyond sense, you have Beyonce. And Chlemnikov, who didn't believe in a kind of coincidence of language, would be quite happy with this kind of uh, fortuitous position of, of, uh, of Beyonce within his, his, uh, his poetry. Now, when Chlebnikov, tra- Chlebnikov believed also, unlike Mayakovsky and unlike Peter the Great and many Russian figures, that Russia's hist- future should be looking towards its Asian, Turkic, Mongol, Persian roots, neighbors, and not towards Europe. So he was a kind of Eurasianist of that time, a very different uh, connotation to today, but he also was called a Russian dervish when he traveled to, to Persia at the time, because he traveled to support the very short-lived socialist, Soviet Socialist Republic on the Caspian Sea, which, so, which lasted about nine months. But he was called a dervish, not because he was a Sufi, but because he looked so terrible when he arrived that he had his clothes were torn, his unshaved, and he was very hungry. So everybody thought he's a kind of Russian dervish, a Sufi who comes from the north. So when we, were, when we did our exhibition at the MoMA, we thought, 
we can't just do a normal exhibition about a topic like we normally do when a museum invites us about satire in the Middle East, about Iran and Poland, or about Fürstenspiegel and the mirrors for princes. We thought, if the MoMA is inviting us to do a show, we have to address what the MoMA stands for. Because in some sense, Slavs and Tatars was created to challenge the idea of modernity that's put forward by the MoMA. If the idea of modernity that's put forward by the MoMA is individualistic, triumphant, victorious, very air-conditioned, steel and glass, then our approach to, let's say, modernity is a different understanding of modernity. It's collective, it's sensual, it's sometimes anonymous, it's uh, not air-conditioned, for sure, and, it's, uh, and it maybe is not rational at some points. And so this idea of even not rational, as you can see in the beginning, we have a, what's called a kitab kebab, which we talked about today a bit. A kitab kebab is a kebab of books, essentially, right? It's a series of books that have been skewered with a kufte kebab to create a kind of mashup of reading. Because if you're like me, or like many of you, I'm sure, when you read two or three books at the same time and you put them by your bedside, you notice that there's a kind of weird resonance between the two books that you're reading, or three books. Why did you choose those three books at the same time? So it's exactly like making a kufte, uh, kebab, you have to mash up the meat with the onions and the parsley and the sumac uh, herbs and it's a different kind, it's not a shishlik, it's not a kind of a, it's not a kot it's a, it's a, it's a kufta kebab. And inside, when people went from the, from the carpeted space inside and created a kind of psychedelic, the idea was to create a psychedelic Muslim library. Right? And, and to come back to this idea when Islam was cool in the 60s and 70s. You remember when Islam was cool? Some people are old enough to remember when Islam was very cool and everybody wanted to be Muslim. You know? Like Heiner Friedrich, the Dia Art Foundation. But today it's the opposite. It's, it, Islam is many things, but it's not cool. Right? Um, and inside we have these three chuz that are dancing around a red fountain. And this red fountain is another example of the spakata, the, the metaphysical splits. Because through a very simple gesture of red, as soon as a child would come inside the space, the, parent, the child wants to run towards the red because the child thinks that the red is a kind of fountain of compote, of Kool-Aid, of a kind of juice. But the parent grabs the child and says, no, 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 don't go, because they think of blood. So on one side, you have this very naive idea of festivity, and on the other side, you have this idea of violent sort of manipulation of violence that we see in martyrdom, that we see in political violence uh, across the Muslim world and, and elsewhere. We talked about today embracing what's very different from yourself, your antithesis, right? Now, actually the first time we became a little bit interested in the changing of alphabets was by translating a journal, the most important periodical of the 20th century Muslim world, was a periodical called Mola Nasruddin. Again, named after the wise fool that we talked about earlier. It was published between Tbilisi, Baku, Tabriz and Baku between 1906 and 1930. It was super progressive for women's rights, against corruption, and against clericalism, against colonialism. And it, had really, it was read from Morocco all the way to India, because it was very well illustrated. So even if you were illiterate, an alphabet, you could still read it, understand it because of the drawings. And we translated this in 2011 into English for the first time, and it's our most successful book in a sense. We're already in a second edition, which is almost finished, um, simply because we made available what was, not av what, what was an important historical document, strangely, the reason why this book was not available, I don't know. People ask me often, you know, why are you interested in this region? Why the Caucasus? Why Central Asia? Because I'm sure most people know better what's happening in Star Trek than they know what's happening in Central Asia, right? And this, for me, is a perfect answer to that question, why this region? Because most people don't go to Baku, and if they go to Baku, they're going for either Eurovision Song Contest or oil contracts, but they're not going to understand certain, let's say, questions of cohabitation, syncretism, uh, is, sort of Muslim progressive ideas at the time. This is an example is of one drawing. This is an Azeri man with his Azeri wife beating her. 
and the same man with his Russian lover on the right. Right? So this double standard of Christian women vis-a-vis -vis Christian women and vis-a-vis -vis Muslim women that this magazine continuously used and, and, and critiqued. And in fact, Azerbaijan gave women the right to vote in 1918, which is before most European countries. And this is something, again, that complicates the narrative that Islam is somehow against women because if a country like Azerbaijan, which is 97% Muslim, gives women the right to vote before 30, 40 years sometimes before European nations, then what does that say about our understanding of, of gender equality, let's say? And the, the magazine constantly was using language as a kind of way to critique power because it was published in Azerbaijani, which at the time was considered to be a dialect and not a language. At the time, if you published, you published either in Istanbul Turkish, official Turkish, or in Russian, but not Azerbaijani. And so here you have on the top the Russian parliament members cutting the, the tongue and putting a Russian tongue of, into the Azeri guy. And on the right, you have students sort of asking the teacher, why do we have to learn another tongue? We have our own tongue already ourselves. But what it really shows of interest is how in the Soviet Union, the Muslim peoples of the Soviet Union had their alphabet changed three times in 100 years. So in 1929, the idea was to cut the Muslims from their Islamic past or their Islamic heritage, so change their alphabet from Arabic to Latin. So you can see here three different scripts, all the same language. On the top, Mola Nasruddin. In the middle, in Cyrillic, Mola Nasruddin. And here, Latin. Same language, three alphabets. So the idea was cut them off from their Arabic script, don't allow them to read the Quran anymore, and then they will become modern. This was Trotsky's idea originally, and neither Trotsky or Lenin lived to see this happen. So everybody changed from Arabic to Latin. Then 1939, 10 years later, Stalin is completely paranoid about pan-Turkism because Ataturk has done the same thing. So one more time, change everything to Cyrillic. And then 1991, change back from Cyrillic to Latin. So you have a situation where you have three generations speaking the same language, a grandmother, a son, and a granddaughter, but not able to read the same book, let's say. So you become immigrants almost within your own language. Now, the philosopher Paul Ricoeur, the French philosopher, who was actually a mentor to, uh, funny enough, to Emmanuel Macron, he, he wrote about language and translation as a form of linguistic hospitality. So you take this idea of Abrahamic hospitality in translation and you're inviting the foreigner into your language and you're expropriating yourself into the language of the foreigner. And if that's the case for language, then for us, transliteration is a form of transvestism within language. So you're not inviting yourself into the foreigner's language, but you're taking the identity or the, the, the gender or the sexuality or even the, the, the being of another and putting it onto yourself without necessarily changing who you are inside. And similarly for the other way around. For example, in Central Asia, Bukhara in Uzbekistan today is considered to be the fourth holiest place in Islam. First is Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, and then Bukhara. That's why they call Bukhara the kind of holy Bukhara, noble Bukhara. And in Bukhara, you had a very strong Jewish population until recently. Now, unfortunately, it's mostly in Israel and in Queens in New York, strangely. But the Bukharan Jews were Jews who wrote, who spoke Persian, so my mother tongue, Farsi of Iran, but they wrote it with Hebrew. So they combined the Hebrew, the alphabet of, let's say, associated with Judaism and spoke a language associated with Shia Islam, let's say, and combined them together. Now, another form of elevation, let's say, is this kind of college humor, to beer or not to beer. You're familiar with this, no? This kind of t-shirt. Please say yes. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. If you've, if you've gone to university somewhere not very smart or you've been to Amsterdam, you probably have seen t-shirts like this. There's another version which says, 
two beers or not two beers, which is even more stupid. But essentially what it is, is it's taking an existential question, right, from Shakespeare's Hamlet, to be or not to be, and it's bringing it down to a very silly level of consumption, to drink a beer or not to drink a beer. Now, if Barbara drinks a beer or doesn't drink a beer, who cares? Go ahead. It makes no difference. The challenge is how can we elevate this, like Chlebnikov, who elevated the trash to the, to the sublime of the shrine, how can we elevate this question back to the original philosophical existential gravitas of to be or not to be? One way to do that is to write it in Arabic script. So if you read this from, left, from right to left, it reads to bir or not to bir. Now, Arabic, as the script of Islam, to bir or not to bir becomes a question again of being or not being. Being Muslim, not being Muslim. Belonging or not belonging. Who one is. So you're taking something very sort of silly and consumer and bringing it back to a question of, let's say, identity and, and existence. Another example is a very curious story of jihad in the First World War. The Germans and the Ottomans in 1915 decide that they're going to declare jihad against the Russians, the English, and the French. But on the side of the Germans, Austro-Hungarians, and the Ottomans. So it was a kind of partial jihad against certain infidels, but on the side of other infidels. And this is part of a large propaganda strategy of the Germans, Kaiser Wilhelm, who basically believed, who wanted to really stoke the fires of political Islam, and he decided to tell all the Muslims of the world, Germany is your friend. If you rise up against your colonial oppressors, who are, of course, all the enemies in the war, the French, the English, and the Russians, if you rise up against your colonial oppressors, we, Germany, will be on your side. So he builds the first functioning mosque on German soil, 70 kilometers from Berlin. Ironically, it's very near, to, it doesn't exist anymore, but it's where one of the largest processing centers for migrants are today. And this is a mosque for prisoners of war, for Muslim prisoners of war, to show as kind of propaganda that this is how we treat our Muslim prisoners. Look how well we treat them. We build a mosque for them. We give them halal food. We have games that are played. And if this is how we treat our prisoners, imagine how we treat non-prisoners. And the, funny, the, the strangest part of the strategy is that they publish a journal for the Muslim prisoners of war called El Jihad. I think this is the first example of political instrumentalization, sorry, instrumentalization of political Islam by a Western country, like we saw 100 years later, with, or less, 70 years later, with the United States supporting the Taliban, for example, against the Soviets, and many other examples. But we, being people who are obsessed with alphabets, we thought, look at the way that jihad is spelled. Can you see the way jihad is spelled? D-S-C-H for J. El jihad D-S-C-H. Four letters for one sound. Why? Ironically, there's no J in German. There's no sound J, so they had to create the J. And so we started to look further and, I said, and look in the dictionary, the kind of the Oxford English Dictionary of German is called the Duden. So I said, I wanted to know what other words are spelled D-S-C-H in German. So I looked up the words, and all the words spelled D-S-C-H are like a greatest hits of Orientalism. You know? Jama, Jalaba, the North African outfits you find, Jidda, the capital, the, the city of, uh, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, Jihad, Genghis Khan. My favorite, of course, is at the bottom, Jungle Fever. Do you know what Jungle Fever is? You know what Jungle Fever is? Yeah? You've seen the movie. Germans definitely have Jungle Fever. You know, look at Boris Becker or Heidi Klum. They definitely have Jungle Fever. Now, this DSCH is, is, is strange because not all words in German are spelled DSCH with J. When a German goes to a bar, and orders a gin and tonic, it's not spelled D-S-C-H. Or when a German buys jeans from Levi's, it's not spelled Levi's D-S-C-H. So the D-S-C-H is a kind of subconscious way to mark these words or these terms as not our jaws, not our culture. 
These are another culture. The gin and tonic is our je. The, the Levi's jeans is our je. The jogging shoe is our je. But the jihad, the jama, the jalaba, these are not our je's. Jungle fever, not our je's. And as soon as they do this, made in this, uh, this jihad, they declare jihad in 1915, the English respond and say, this is a jihad made in Germany. And that's also very strange because I can think of a lot of ways to, crit to criticize something, but made in Germany is not the first thing that comes to mind. You know, what does a jihad made in Germany mean? That it's very technically proficient and super engineered and lasts for like 20 years. It costs a lot of money, but it's very well engineered. What does it mean, jihad made in Germany? Of course, what they meant was that it's not legitimate because it started in Germany and it didn't start in, in, in Istanbul or in Baghdad or in uh, Mecca, for example. The most successful example of alphabet politics, of course, is Ataturk's changing the Turkish alphabet. Why is it the most successful? Because it was only 80 years ago, and today nobody contests it. That's a very short amount of time to change a whole alphabet of a language and be not controversial. Not even the most right-wing, crazy, fanatical Islamist in Turkey believes that Turkish should come back to Arabic script. It's finished. Latin is the, is the alphabet of Turkish language. Now, it was an ideological reason, of course, to put your destiny onto the destiny of the West and, and, and move forward and reflect the West the way that Peter the Great did in Russia by creating St. Petersburg. By, but also there was a real objective reason for Ataturk to do this because the Turkish alphabet, the Turkish language has eight, sometimes nine vowels, but Arabic only has three. In Arabic, you have these diacritics, these accents that you don't write, as an adult, everybody just knows the sounds. So in Arabic, the only vowels are A, U, and E. So how do you say these weird Turkish sounds like E, uh, or the French, Turkish, the Russian, you have it in German also, E, uh, U, uh, the umlauts, yeah? the O with the two dots, the U with the two dots. So they changed the alphabet in 1928, but when you add sounds or alphabets, scripts, you also lose certain sounds. The Turks used to have two N's. They had an N which is like never, like Nancy, Nant, but they also had an N which was pronounced like this. Mm. Try pronouncing mm. Mm. Sounds like you're having an orgasm, but uh, it's, it's not so uh, perverse. Mm. It's pronounced by using your nose. It's a nasal sound. So in the same way that H is a guttural sound using your throat, M mm is a nasal sound using your nose. And the question always is when you're an artist doing research outside of art, what are you bringing to the table that academics, scholars, activists, other people in civil society have not already done? Well, I hope one thing that we're trying to understand is to what extent all the sounds of language, all the pronunciation of language, is done with organs which are very erogenous. The nose, the teeth, the lips, the throat, the mouth, the ears, the neck. It's all very sensuous parts of the organs, of, of the body. And we often just say mother tongue or father tongue. In Polish, you say father tongue. But it's always the tongue as a kind of metonymic abstraction. But actually, language, even the tongue, if you think the tongue is kind of Rolling Stone's tongue, it's an idealized tongue, just ask the person next to you to lift their tongue. Look underneath somebody's tongue the next time you have, some, have a moment. It's not a clean, cute organ. It's a throbbing organ with green and gray uh, veins popping out of it. So language is a very messy thing through which we can try to understand sort of non-rational, not necessarily uh, linear stories. So this is the mm that Ataturk wanted to get rid of. Why? Because mm, for me, sounds very Asian also. In fact, if you don't believe me, go to Wikipedia and put mm, and there's an entry in Wikipedia of Chinese people with the first name mm. Millions of them. It's written in, in Latin, ng. If you go to a Chinese restaurant and you want to order water spinach, you order ng choy. Mm sounds like a gong almost. You know, it's a very, so it's, again, it, 
it, maybe it wasn't a co conscious decision of Ataturk to, to get rid of the sound, but if he wants to make Turkish Western, then it's not a coincidence that he lets go of the most Asian-sounding phoneme in the alphabet. In fact, it was so widespread in Turkish that some of the words you might know in Turkish, if you've been to Istanbul and you see the famous bank, Deniz Bank, it used to be Dangiz, or the famous word for the sky, the kind of pre-Islamic Genghis Khan Buddhist word for sky was Tanri. It's actually Tanri. So it's an ng and not a, not a n -ri. N R. it's an ng -ri. So our second follow-up, nice, I can hear it. <laughs> it's coming better. Um, our second follow-up book to H was a book about the nasals, all about the nose as a site of resistance. In the, Rus in the Polish alphabet, the Poles also have nasals, which is very rare in, in Slavic languages. Most Slavic languages don't have nasal sounds. The Poles have these sounds, um, you can see on the left, ow and ow, which the Russians couldn't, when they Cyrillicized the alphabets, they couldn't find a way to Cyrillicize these, these letters. They had to create letters. That's the letter that they created, the, the Russians in the 19th century, when they tried to Cyrillicize now, alphabets really accompany empires. It's important that we understand alphabets are not innocent. The Latin alphabet accompanied Christianity and then secularization that accompanied Latin. The Arabic alphabet, of course, accompanied the rise of Islam in the 7th century onwards. And the Cyrillic alphabet accompanied the rise of Orthodox Christianity and then communism five, six centuries later. One other thing that the Soviets did is that they made sure when they Cyrillicized an alphabet to give each nation, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Azerbaijan, a different letter for the same sound. So kind of divide and conquer to make sure that they would not be able to be mutually intelligible. These sounds, these letters here are all the letter J, like the German Jihad. These are all different ways that the Soviets gave J to the Muslim populations living under their uh, power. So when we decided to kind of do a nose twister, or kind of a spagata of the nose, so we wanted to do an N that manages to this N and the other N. Mm. We, we decided to copy a beautiful Turkic nose of the wife of a very famous Azeri painter, Tahir Salahov, super beautiful nose from very Turkic. And we decided to make a kind of a furniture piece where the nose is doing the twists, or the kind of the, the, sp the spagat. So it's a nose that's hitting both, both ends in some sense, and you can sit against it, and you can, uh, in fact, try your best. And, or, mm. I'll end with an anecdote or a story of why certain alphabet changes are successful and certain other ones aren't. As you might know, current today's Hebrew is a creation of the late 19th, early 20th century, Hebrew was always a liturgical, religious language. And when the Zionists created Israel in the late 19th, well, settled in Israel, in Palestine, they decided all these Zionists were European Jews who were writing and reading in Latin. So the question was, why not just create Hebrew as a Latin uh, language for everyday use and keep the Hebrew alphabet for the religious use of the language? And there was a big debate, and one of the scholars we studied with for this research, he said that he did a kind of criteria of why certain alphabet changes work and others don't. Why Turkish worked, Hebrew didn't. Is that you have to have an inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis the alphabet you're changing to. Turks in 1928 had an inferiority complex towards Europe because of the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Jews in the late 19th century didn't have this inferiority complex. There was a missionary uh, impulse to the creation of Palestine, of Israel in the, in the late 19th century. Also, it helps to have a very low level of literacy. In, in Turkey, 6% were literate, so it's much easier to change the alphabet. The European Jews who settled in Palestine were, 20, were between 25 and 35% literate, so much more difficult, in some sense, to change the alphabet. And I'll end with a quote from Marshall McLuhan, the media theorist, who talks about the Greek alphabet, the Greek myth, that the alphabet was that Cadmus, reputedly the king, who introduced the phonetic letters into Greece, sowed the dragon's teeth, 
And then they sprang up as armed men. Languages are filled with a testimony to the grasping, devouring power and precision of teeth. Letters are not only like teeth visually, but their power to put teeth into the business of empire building is manifest in our Western history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Payam, for this uh, journey. I, um, I wanted to say that, um, f like for the first time, I came, I became touch with your research in um, in 2014 in Moscow when uh, you came and um, uh, showed uh, to us, to group of people who were attending this workshop with me, some of your projects that you did for that time, and I remember very well that. Then we come back to our classroom <laughs> and we started to discuss what actually had been seen. Um, some of my colleagues, as I said, that um, something like uh, it was uh, too fun or maybe it was like just fun and nothing else. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to ask you about this, about um, like uh, irony and, um, and the humor, which is something very present in your research because for me now, not at the time, but now it's kind of clear that uh, um, like what are you doing actually in your in your work? It's kind of trying to bring back some some things and uh, make them make them visible somehow, and also like reflect on um, like why or like how this thing should be kind of um, remembered, no? And if they should be remembered, and uh, in doing this, it's like of course. Not enough for you just put them in light, which is something that artists and uh, curators are doing, but you also like trying to activate this knowledge, no? And you are doing this uh, through, and we, we discuss also about it in the workshop, you are doing this not only like discursively, but also like physically and uh, sensually, no? Let's say uh, in your, I'm, I'm referring like on, on objects that you are uh, producing. so. For me, it's kind of like clear that uh, this humor and irony are you're using. It's kind of tool to engage with people, uh, with public, also because like um, your work is referring to some very specific area, no? Which is also like very um, not very uh, yeah, not very familiar for people here. It, like we feel a bit uncomfortable about uh, think about something. So. Like, yeah, actually, I wanted to ask, after this very long introduction, I wanted to ask you about this because I think that, like, this kind of critique of being uh, too fun or maybe not serious enough uh, was addressed to you, to what are you doing. And so I was uh, curious to, to, to know what, what do you respond because I'm sure that this is something that you are doing very consciously and you, you have to say something um, like more about this. So, this question of um, fun, it's a good question. It's a critique we get a lot. Uh, I, we always get it from a certain corner of Europe, which is like Benelux for some reason. Maybe that's where the Trotskyists are still uh, hiding. Is the, the idea is that if you're doing political work or you're doing serious work, you have to do it in a way which is serious. It should look serious, it should look political. It should not be colorful, not be fun, not be funny. And I think that's a very diff I think there's several ways to understand this. One is, I think we're living in a different world than in the 70s and 80s when political art, I can just take one example, Hans Hacke, who, whose work I like, or even Barbara Kruger, whose work I like. Let's say Kruger, or certain artists in, in, in a different time, we're speaking at an audience. And I think that today we have to speak with an audience, which means that um, the artist can't be in a pedagogical position. I always, that's why we started as a reading group, is in a reading group there's no hierarchy. There's no leader of a reading group. We are sharing our research and we're inviting 
other people to come along the research with us. And it's one of the things I'm actually most proud of is that we have a, lar we have a kind of significant interest from people who are not normally interested in art. Because, our, because a lot of art looks like art from a far away. Sort of, it's very clear, the way it's lit, the way it's installed, it's like, I am serious, I am important, I am precious. And I like to, even in our books, you don't know what is our work, what is research, what is black and white, what is color, it's all mixed in a way that it's sort of flattened in a sense. Another thing I think is that, to be real, to be uh, practical also and very cynical, we talked about this today in the workshop, is if you're dealing with the subject matter that we're dealing with, you have to acknowledge that most people don't give a rat's ass about Central Asia, the Caucasus, or even Eastern Europe. We live in a world which is still very Western-centric. The art world is still between the Rhineland and New York, and that's how narrow it is. So for me to even push towards Bukhara, forget Poland and, and, uh, and Russia, Bukhara and, uh, and, uh, and others, you have to kind of meet your audience a little bit halfway. So humor, for me, is a way of, of disarming the, 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 the public, not to kind of thinking that it's not necessarily something so remote or so foreign, but actually can be more familiar. Also, humor is, a, for, me, is a, is a very, for me, humor is a question of generosity. Actually, humor is a way of, of, of a kind of Abrahamic generosity, of really inviting again somebody into, an, into a foreign idea or foreign space. And finally, I think, uh, this what we, again, we spoke about it a little bit earlier today, is, is I think it's very easy to critique something. I think it's very difficult to do the spagata and commemorate and critique at the same time. And humor is a way of really kind of embracing something, but also tearing it down at the same time with the same gesture. And I think uh, this... this, uh, this it's a similar, I mean, the, the kind of the other critique is that why are you using so many colors? It's so orientalist. But these are, these are funny enough critiques that we get only from the sort of certain corners of the art world. Never have we ever been critiqued in this way from scholars in the field, let's say regional studies or others, because again, it's a question of uh, is, is there one language of, I mean, it's a big, it's a, actually, it's a very good question. George Orwell would say that every joke is a tiny revolution, right? But other people say that humor is a way to deflate the tension, that if you don't deflate it, the tension will lead to a revolution, which is good. So humor is a kind of palliative care. So maybe we shouldn't be joking, we should actually le let the tension rise, and then we have real change, as opposed to satire, which just sort of makes it more uh, accessible. It's, I don't know where I stand on that, to be honest. And there is, sorry, a difference for you to um, be ironical and to make fun, um, like about something and on something. Yes, I think I, I didn't like this word irony until recently, until we were studying Haman, this uh, Johann Georg Haman, until I understood that that Haman was somebody who Kierkegaard called Haman the biggest humorist in history. Haman was somebody who believed that Christianity is a fundamentally ironic religion because everything is what it's not, right? The, the meek shall inherit the earth, the rich are the poor, the poor are the rich. So you can look at Jesus as a very ironic figure. And I think that's a very interesting way to think about irony as a religious irony, and not, I, because irony has this connotation for me of light humor, uh, or distance. And I don't think we have a distance to what we're doing as much as uh, an intimacy with it. Um, it's, yeah. I don't know if I answered that second question. Yeah, this is about the difference on, on, uh, on yes. something or about yes. something, which if there is a difference from you, yes. for you. It's very important, actually. The distinction is, is it's very, we try not to have humor, which is at the expense of something. We don't make fun of people or things. So that's why the difference between Mola Nasruddin and Charlie Hebdo, Charlie Hebdo is, they say that humor should always punch up and not punch down. Charlie Hebdo was punching down. Charlie Hebdo was making fun of uh, the religion of, an of a kind of marginalized immigrant communities in France. But Mola Nasruddin was punching up, was making fun of the people in power, the Russian Empire, 
the, the clerics. It was, it was attacking those above itself. So I think it's always important to make sure that your humor is not, it's a humor that is, again, generous and not at the expense of somebody else. Ci sono altre domande? Then I have a question. <laughs> sure. That... Um, well, today it, it, this comes up a lot, but we've been trying also to think about, I mean, where do you locate yourself and how do you change yourself by learning through other cultures and, and, and so on. So, how would you describe maybe the difficulties or non-difficulties about locating yourself within one culture or maybe a Western culture? Or an, I mean, you've been traveling through many languages and many cultures throughout your life, but also throughout this lecture. So, if you were to place yourself in any position, which would be the place you would never kind of <laughs> identify with, or is there any possibility of sort of building an identity without locating it in a specific time and culture? So, I can only, because I'm only one of several members, let's say, um, I can only answer for myself on this, is... Uh, I happen to have devoted my intellectual life and my languages to three countries which are all enemies. Iran, Russia, and the United States. So, Iran and Russia are historical enemies. Iran and the United States are present enemies. Russia and the United States are present enemies and historical enemies. So this is something which is important because I do fundamentally believe that it's only by... The only way we can overcome this question of identity politics that we're seeing today is by accumulating more identities in a very sincere way. And almost like the way you make foie gras. You know, you kill the goose of foie gras by stuffing it so much with food that its liver bursts. And that's how we have to kind of collapse identity politics is by imploding the, the questions of identities. So if you, when we mentioned today, if you're, if you're trying to resolve the necessary conflicts between any two identities and you negotiate that on a daily basis, that's, that's a kind of resolution, I think, to the, to the question of identity politics. Um, Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a form of also productive schizophrenia, you know, because you're different people in different languages, you're different people in Japanese than you are in uh, Pugliese, or you're in uh, French or in Russian, you're, you have a different sense of humor, so you're necessarily different. And I think that's also another way to, to kind of uh, put pressure on this idea that we're, we're being told by our societies, which is that you have one identity, and that is who you are, I think it's nonsense. There's no such thing as a singular identity. Singular, I mean, even in any of these nations, there's no homogenous Poland. Poland was Jewish and Muslim, as, uh, just as Catholic. There's no Italian identity until relatively recently, right? And these are obviously constructs, so... Okay, so I have another question, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that I'll, I'll, I'll sort of shut up after that. But um, one thing I was thinking when you were talking about Mullah Nasreddin uh, before, was sitting a sort of turn backwards, and you also quoted uh, Walter Benjamin and the angel, etc., etc. But there is also another important idea that I sort of learned from Benjamin, which is about us being usually very uncomfortable, not with the past and not with the idea of the future, but I mean, our blind spot somehow is the recent past. 
because you kind of gain a certain distance towards, I don't know, a century ago, 50 years ago, but the recent past, which is not historicized, maybe it's not already in the books, it relies a lot on personal memories, it has a number of implications. And the idea of Mullah Nasruddin actually facing exactly to that minute, and sort of that recent past, to me it's very fascinating because, I mean, it kind of puts you in the position of actually looking to what you've just left behind. Mm. Not miles away, but kind of close, close enough to make you understand a number of things about the direction you're taking. And would it make any sense? <laughs> yeah, I think that's the most difficult is the recent past, of course. is. Uh in fact, in our current environment, I think uh, it's very difficult to make work which is in some ways reflecting the current environment because it's changing so quickly and it's too close for us to understand the, the kind of importance of what's happening. Um, I, th yeah, I think that's, I mean, we have one of our lecture performances is, is about the kind of the Iranian revolution as a, as a next step of the Russian revolution, right? In the same way that 1917 was the beginning of communism, let's say, and the Iranian revolution of 79 was the beginning of political Islam. Well, the end of communism was 89, right? So that was the kind of book ends. But the idea of liberal capitalism or Anglo-American capitalism has also ended. The problem is we don't have a date yet, right? Is that it's very clear since the financial crisis that a certain type of capitalism doesn't work but we haven't put a date on it yet because the United States didn't break up into 50 different countries like the Soviet Union did. And it's not as clear, but it's slowly dying, a kind of different death. And uh, so this even, 2009 is too, too close in some sense. I think that we need a much more uh, time to understand uh, events, much less, you know, the recent sort of rise of right-wing politics as well. It's just too close to understand, I think. It doesn't mean we shouldn't act and be active in resisting it and that's why one of the reasons we I told you about the kind of our switch or transition of our practice but you can't respond if you respond I think it was Pierre Wig who said that if you if you respond to what's happening around you then you make work about shit because what's happening around you is shit you, you don't want that kind of energy wise that 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 uh, unhealthy uh, politics to infest your your thoughts as a writer as a thinker as an artist Io lo rendo il microfono. I think there's a mutiny on the right here if we continue any longer. <laughs> no? Okay. Grazie.